the 2018 Progress Seminar. Brought to you by the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. For over 48 years, the Progress Seminar has been bringing together local business, government, and community leaders to focus on the most important issues facing our communities. With over 350 attendees from San Mateo County and statewide, this multi-day seminar and networking extravaganza not only features multiple keynote speeches, but also several intimate breakout sessions, including San Mateo County Housing Revolution, Redefining Expectations, future of mobility, looking ahead in 2030, innovation and disruption, and its impact on workforce development, transit, TDM, TNC, and a autonomous future, driving a stake through the heart of your traffic jam. Psychology of change. For more info on the 2018 Progress Seminar, or to see the footage from past Progress Seminars, go to pentv.tv slash progress seminar. gentlemen, Carol Groom and Roseanne Faust. So we're going to ask, before we kick this off, we're going to ask our three panelists to, to come on up and join us. So this is where I need everyone to raise their hands when I ask this next question, because this will move this along beautifully. Everyone has read Kate, Mary, and Ruben's bios in the program, <laughs> really? correct? Yay. Hands up. Good job. <laughs> Excellent. That's impressive. <laughs> These are three very accomplished individuals running campaigns, organizations, and really working to make our system, and I don't want to say our electoral system or our community, it's our whole entire ecosystem better. And they're with us here today. Carol and I both have a few questions that we're going to kick off the panel, because as you saw in the program, the title of it, it's been 25 years since the year of the woman. Where are we now? Where do you think we are? <laughs> and I, I, it, it's very funny to sit up here and to see the looks on some of your faces because you're like, oh boy, where are we now? But Carol and I, so we're going to pose a few questions, but the way Sunday tends to work really, really well is with all of you. So as they make their opening remarks, go over the questions that we've discussed with them, Think about what you want to ask, because the dialogue is really the beauty of where the Progress Seminar comes from. That's why yesterday it was very important in all the breakouts, as well as the morning and the lunch, to have a dialogue with the audience. So we really encourage you. I know you're all a little tired from last night, whatever revelry everyone did. <laughs> Wake up. Okay, there's a bunch of coffee back there. So Carol, I'm going to ask you to kick it off. Okay. I'm going to ask the three of you to tell us a little bit about your respective organizations. Um, they've read your bios, but they may not quite understand the depth of what you all do. So Kate, would you like to begin? Absolutely. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, good morning. My name is Kate Mater, and I started an organization called Women Get It Done about five years ago. And what that was really um, meant to do was to organize women um, from all different walks of life and to create a culture of women helping women. And so we create safe spaces for women to connect and build intersectional, uh, long-lasting relationships. Uh, when I started it in San Francisco um, in 2012, uh, what I didn't realize is that we tapped into something really powerful. And we created a model for women to organize themselves. And so now we're in eight cities, probably 10 by the end of the year, uh, for women to really come together and to connect. Thank you. Mary? Good morning. It's nice to see everybody. Thank you very much for having me back. It's wonderful to be with you. I am the founder of Close the Gap California. Close the Gap California is a 10-year campaign 
to recruit progressive women to the California legislature. Why, you might ask, do we need to do that? Sadly, we do need to do that. And here's what sparked um, that campaign. In 2006, almost a third of the California legislature was female. We ranked fifth in the nation, and we were on our way to parity. And it looked great. 12 years later, 21% of the legislature was female, and we had dropped from fifth to 32nd in the country. This was very disturbing, and while we can talk about the reasons that that, that trend developed, um, I wanted to do something that was both an intervention and a reverse course. And so I did a lot of research, and what I learned was women who were competing for open seats were winning at the same rate as men. The problem, and the problem is not solved, is that women have a much harder time coming to the decision to run for office across the board, but particularly for partisan office. And they need to understand what's required. They need to see the path in more detail than men. And they need to know that there is a support system there to get that job done. But once they know that, talented women will step up. And that's been our experience since we started in 2013. So um, I'm happy to tell you of the last four, uh, we hit a low point at 21% uh, of the legislature in 2016. And that was demoralizing because we had started and wanted to reverse. And now uh, I can tell you that in a special election in December, uh, a woman was elected in the three special elections in Los Angeles on April 3rd. Um, two of the three were won by women. One of them won outright, and I believe has been sworn in. Is that right, Kevin? Uh, so a wonderful woman named Sydney Kamlager is now in the assembly. And another woman who we recruited, Luz Rivas, uh, placed first by a significant margin and looks very good to win her race in a runoff in June. So we're on our way, but um, there's a lot to do. Ruben, how about Grow Elect? So, uh, well, first of all, it's great to be back to Progress Seminar. Amy, I love what you've done with the place. Uh, great, uh, great turnout. Um, so Grow Elect is a, a group that recruits and helps to elect Latino Republicans to office. And I know in California, People don't think there are any such thing as Latino Republicans, but uh, there are a few. So far, we've started around the same time frame, 2013, I, I, I started doing this. Uh, we've, so far, we've helped to elect um, almost 200 uh, candidates to local offices around the state of California. As a matter of fact, we are responsible for 50% of the Hispanic legislators in Sacramento, of the Hispanic Republican legislators in Sacramento today, 50%. So that means one guy. Uh, <laughs> Dante Acosta, who, uh, who Dante was a, uh, he was a, um, uh, uh, ran for city council, so the model that I'm trying to develop, and we can talk about the, the you know, the elephant, the orange elephant in the room, but, um, you know, it's, in terms of the Republican brand, uh, the idea had been, and think back, you know, ancient history, 2012 election, uh, Mitt Romney loses, the GOP says, hey, let's do an autopsy. Oh, what we need to do is reach out to Hispanic and women voters and, my other, and, my, my, and minority voters. Um, so, of course, that's exactly what they did, right? Exactly not. Um, so, so the whole idea of Grow Elect is to say, you know what, there are uh, Republican Hispanics out there and, and really looking at folks that are for economic growth, free enterprise and economic growth. We want to help elevate them so that they can be part of this center-right coalition in California, which is going to die if it doesn't have more diversity within it. So I go out and recruit uh, Latinas and Latinos um, who qualify, and the, the more local, the better, special districts, city councils, county offices. And I raise money, I help fund their campaigns, mm -hmm. we help them with their mail, their data, their walking, mm -hmm. their ground game, all that, and we help get them elected to office. That's the whole model of what we're doing because we want to increase those numbers. This being California, just this last election cycle, 
uh, we made a big decision for us. Grow Elect is still, uh, is still you know, what does uh, Andreessen say? You are what you go public as. So Grow Elect is a Republican, independent Republican group that does that. We also have now a nonpartisan PAC mm -hmm. that helps focus on Latinos and Latinas who are independent and Democrat, again, who, are, who you know, believe in free enterprise and, and, and the growth of the private sector economy in California, and we're helping them. And so we've got a, a handful of victories in, the, in that regard. Um, but the whole idea is to build a farm team at the local level because most, not all, but, but over 50% over of the legislators in Sacramento and our members of Congress came from the local level. They were school board members, city council members, and so our idea is we gotta get folks elected to the local level so that they can potentially, some of them, most won't, but some of them will then move on to, to higher office. Thank you, Ruben. Roseanne? So Kate, you started the organization Women Get It Done. Why do you think it's needed and relevant today? I mean, and what would you wanna share with the audience, both men and women? Well, I think right now why it's needed more than ever, um, and when I say we're creating these safe spaces, what it is is women coming together in a salon style format to really talk and have like real talk, um, ask the hard questions, have the hard conversations. Um, and in different cities, it's been uh, very valuable um, for a number of ways. Um, one, after the 2016 election, in 2017, we saw this spark of activism from the Women's March to new groups forming and people putting their heart and souls in not just political activism but also community organizing. And so what Women Get It Done really became was a, a place for those activists to recharge and to ask the uh, ideas and um, to figure out where do we go from here. People have been having, um, at least in my world, these existential crises about where our country is going, um, how can they lend their talent or time or treasure to uh, what's next and how can they make an impact in the world. Um, and it's also been uh, the model that we've created with Women Get It Done has been really uh, valuable at making sure that people from different parties, political parties, um, can come and talk about the issues and ask those hard questions. So it's not, we are not seeing so much of this divisive rhetoric on social media platforms, but also kind of having these spaces for people to have the conversations, for example, um, why did a majority of white women vote for Trump? Let's peel back the curtain, let's have those hard conversations and talk about race and sexism and, and all those things. Hold that thought, because I think we're gonna come back to that one later, but I'm gonna <laughs> throw it over to Carol. Ruben, what, what, when, you're, when you're talking to candidates or potential candidates, what, what are you telling them in this, in this time right now of a very uncivil uh, a discourse that goes on? How, how do you convince somebody that to step into the public and put, you know, really put your, put, your, put your whole life out there for about six or seven months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, the reality is um, I usually am talking people out of running rather than into running. <laughs> uh, it's kind of easy to decide I want to run it's really hard to run and to be, you know, to be truly competitive. Mm -hmm. um, there are occasions where we are recruiting uh, candidates, um, and I, I, you know, I, uh, what, I, I do, um, like I describe sushi as cold dead fish, right? I mean, I just like tell people, like, here's what it is, and it's not pretty. And uh, if you're going to run, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough on your family life. It's going to be tough on your finances, uh, and you're going to, you know, it's going to be unpleasant. So, you know, hope you do it. Um, so uh, I try to be, try to be honest with you. Ma and Mary, how do, how do you approach that? You know what? I talk about the good you can do. Oh, yeah, there's that, too. And <laughs> it just occurred to me. But I think that um, California is extraordinary in this regard. Um, you know, in many other states, the legislatures are much larger. And the districts are much smaller. So in Vermont, you can be representing 8,000 people. In California, if you are a state senator, you represent more people than a United States congressperson. And most folks don't recognize that. So you start with the numbers, the proportion, the size of it. It's big and it's important. It's important not only because we are the sixth largest economy in the world, but it is important because our legislature models for the rest of the country. So if you want to have an impact 
on improving the world, being a state legislator in California is a big bite and you can have a lot of impact. So I start with, and, and actually there's someone in the legislature today, uh, this was my pitch. This young woman was going in a big different direction and I made the case that you can t have a real impact on the things that you care about in the short term and have it ripple across the country. And so get good at this, be good at it, be vocal about it, and be a crusader, and you can have national impact. And for people who are ambitious, and don't kid yourself, the people who go to the legislature are ambitious. If you are ambitious, that is a big, beautiful target. And the rest of it is a lot easier as Ruben described, those things are hard, but it's a lot easier to find your way over, around, or through them if you have a goal that is both good for the common good and exciting to you. So that's how I make my okay. case. All right. So thinking back 25 years, are we better off today than we were in 1993 or not? <laughs> Who, who wants to jump Let's in? Let's see, on back that in '93, <laughs> Jerry Hill was a Republican. John <laughs> uh, Horsley was the sheriff, the new sheriff in town. And I think John Malpe was the county manager. So, uh, <laughs> so some things do change. Uh, but, <laughs> It, it, I think, as Mary said, um, you kind of go, you, you, you go up and down uh, with uh, women re represented in the legislature. You, know, you think, hey, we're making progress. The 1980s were the decade of the sleeping giant. The Hispanic community was going to wake up, and you know, and we're still, you know, uh, Latinos are still underrepresented and underperforming in terms of uh, voter turnout. Um, so, you know, in, w in some ways, we are, I think, mm -hmm. much better off uh, in, you know, in terms of society and the evolution. Uh, but I think uh, it just to me heightens the, the commitment that needs to be made. Because if you don't commit to it in long term, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen on its own. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got to work at it day, day in and day out. Yeah, and I think I bring two different perspectives to the conversation. Um, one, I'm a millennial, and I also I get to see the compassion and the power of that generation with the digital tools that we have now to communicate and to organize. Um, and I'm, I can see it, they're so altruistic in a lot of ways and very community-minded. And so that gives me hope. On the other hand, I'm the campaign manager for a woman running for lieutenant governor, and we've never had a female lieutenant governor before in this state. I've never had, another, I've never had a female governor either, but we're going to have to <laughs> wait until that can happen. Uh, to break that glass ceiling. Um, and Eleni Kunalakis has what it takes to win. She works harder than anyone I've ever met. But being with her on the campaign trail, you know, she's been to all 58 counties. She's outworking the opponents. But I get to see the overt and the covert sexism that happens. And we call it the glass ceiling because it's invisible. And you you don't see it or feel it until you hit your head against it. And so I think that 25 years later, it's, people are calling this the year of the woman. And I hope, I'm hopeful that it's actually going to happen. But I think that, like Ruben said, we all have a lot of work to do to have that commitment to ensuring it does. Hmm. So um, the answer is uh, two steps forward, one step back. We are much better off in terms of raw numbers in the United States Congress in 1992, the reason we got to call it the Year of the Woman was twofold. There were a series of um, circumstances that came together in between 1990 and 1992 that propelled more women to run and more women were elected. And those circumstances involved things that you will vaguely remember, but the ma uh, there was a cluster, uh, cancer clusters uh, for breast cancer around the country, very alarming. We learned that the National Institutes of Health, for which we all pay taxes, was doing clinical trials only on white men and extrapolating and applying 
applying that data to women, which was nuts. Uh, we, we got very agitated about these, you know, uh, slights. And then along came Anita Hill. And so she was the match that lit the fire. Women came out in big numbers and ran. And we added um, 24 new women to the House of Representatives, the highest number we've ever added before or since. And the or since is the step back. Mm -hmm. So big year, excitement, a lot of similarity with Me Too and the, uh, the exposure of uh, really just the, the worst of us, the worst mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. And, and the, un, the unpleasantness of having to look at it, but knowing, good, we got that out. We got it out, we'll deal with it. Good news, lots of good things happening this year to also spark that. I'm happy to tell you, as of April 6th, 309 women have filed to run for the House of Representatives, and only 21 states have closed filing. Mm -hmm. And that is more women than have ever filed. So there will be a huge uptick in the number of women running for office for, for Congress. There will also be in the state of California. Um, and the issue is, can they make it? And that, so we are much better off in the sense that there's much more support, many more organizations, much more available funding, much more confidence in mm -hmm. funding women today than there was 25 years ago. Uh, we have many more benchmarks of women who can go the distance. We have had a speaker of the House of Representatives and will again. And so um, <laughs> there, there are factors like that that just make women powerful women, extraordinarily capable women, mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. who you can see and model. And that wasn't true 25 years ago when we took the first big step. So be prepared for a second big step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I also mention, so it was 100 years ago this year that the first women were elected to the California legislature. Um, today, the, the president mm -hmm. pro tem of the Senate is a woman, uh, Tony Atkins, who happened to have been the speaker of the assembly. Mm -hmm. That's the first right. time that's ever happened. That's right. So you have these houses. accomplishments, mm -hmm. the raw numbers, uh, still need a lot of work, but in terms of examples of leadership, I mean, Tony has demonstrated, and, and Tony's just a, a beautiful person, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, to, to see someone like that as a role model to show uh, women, in this case, that you know, they can be leaders uh, in California government, um, I think it's a powerful thing. Kate, you said something a minute ago um, about running campaigns, and in, in addition to the digital aspect, what else are you doing differently today than you might have, than might have been done five or 10 years ago? In terms of running political yeah, campaigns, yeah. Um, I, th you know, I think that right now, where we are at this point in time, after the 2016 election, um, that people, we candidates and campaigns need to understand that people matter, and that we need to listen extraordinarily more than we have done in the past five or ten years ago with campaigns. Um, there's a lot of power in actually listening to people, engaging them, um, which you can do in person and online. Um, and I think the old playbook of running campaigns, uh, it's, it's, the playbook is changing. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of, of folks out there who run campaigns who primarily just focus on advertising. And they say, well, let's just spend $5 million on TV ads and you're mm -hmm. gonna win. That's the old school way of looking at it. We actually need to engage people in a dialogue um, before the TV ads go up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we think it's time to open it up for questions. This audience usually is not shy, so I'm waiting for somebody to hop up. I see Joe, I see Steve Howard, I see Shiloh. So let's start with Joe Gothels, former mayor, current council member, city of San Mateo. Oh, we have a microphone, Joe, if you could just wait. You could just wait one second since we are filming for Peninsula Television. Thank you very much to Penn TV for being here. I actually wanted to follow up on that last question. I think, I think there might be more to the answer. I think in, in today's world, it's easier to call out the covert sexism that was referred to earlier. We've adopted a language now 
uh, whether it's Me Too or whether it's mansplaining or whatever it is, when, when, when it's happening, especially that covert uh, sexism, calling it out is very important, I think, for female candidates and, and electeds, and I just wanted your comments on that. So thank you for asking that, Joe. Um, it, it's been very interesting. The evolution over the last 10 years has been in, in two directions. For a long time, and you'll remember because in our media market, when Dianne Feinstein was mayor of San Francisco, she showed up in suits that were dark and one color, and she even wore ties, those little bow ties. Remember when that was sty stylish? And, um, and there was a tendency to believe that in order for women to succeed, they would have to be like men in a variety of ways, and, and I always point to that because it seemed to me the most ridiculous way, but it was <laughs> visible, and so you were less flamboyant or easy to criticize. But what has happened over the 10 years is, I, I think about it this way, most candidates want you to see this much of them. They want you to see the part they've prepared. Over time, because of the media expansion and because of uh, just the way uh, it has evolved, we really know way too much about most candidates, more than we want. And, um, and yet, that's been good for women and men in this regard. People didn't used to talk about their real life experience as a part of campaigning. They would tell you their view on issues. Now, they can say, I'm, I'm running because I'm in a sandwich generation. I've got kids at home who can't, who've come from college. I've got parents who need my help. What the system we have to help both of those groups isn't working, so I want to go and do something about it. Both men and women have access to a 360 degree experience that they can use to talk about why public policy matters to our lives. You can thank women for that. They broke through by saying, I'm a mom, and let me tell you, the schools aren't working for my kids. Mm -hmm. And then men saw there was something emotionally compelling about that, and they wanted some of that. <laughs> and so now what you have is people talking to people, not so gendered in our silos. And I think it's healthier, and I think uh, it, it makes for better, well, I know, it makes for better public policy. <coughs> Steve Howard? Dr. Steve Howard, I should say. Mm -hmm. Dr. Howard. Yes. Thank you. As, as a voter, I, I try to function a little bit like the voice uh, TV show, where the judges <laughs> don't see, all they do is hear the voice. So I, I try to make my decisions based on who I think, what I'm hearing, who's the best candidate, regardless of color, or man, woman, do they have a D or an R after their name? So tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me why now I should be picking candidates based on their sex or their background. Uh, why shouldn't I still be looking for who's the best candidate for this position? It's a great question. So the whole issue of identity politics and all. Um, so part of the answer is um, everyone, I haven't met anyone who says, uh, well, actually I have. <laughs> but most normal people say, I vote for the person, not the party. Right? But in reality, most people vote for the party. I mean, that's just the reality. I mean, in, in campaigns, that's how it breaks down. And that's the first thing you look at when you analyze a district and say, is it winnable or not, depending on what party you are. I mean, that's the, that's the first thing. There are a lot of other factors. But that's just a, a reality in the political sense. The other side of it is um, we're talking about trying to get qualified people an opportunity to be competitive. Because, you know, campaigning. Uh, Electoral politics is a, it's like a business. You all, those of you in, in business or running a department, or there, there are certain things you have to do and know to be good at running your business, right? And being successful at what you do. Same thing applies to politics. And if you don't know how to win an election, you could be the best potential office holder in the world, but you will never have a chance to win because you, you're not doing the basic things you need to do. So what we try to do is uh, we try to find really good Latinas, Latinos, who we think would do a great job as an elected official. 
and, and we try to help them get through that electoral process so that then you can decide whether or not you want to vote for them because they're actually competitive. And my, my first response um, hearing your question is that you're not wrong. I think it's very important to make sure that you're voting for the person that aligns with your values, and that's what the representative democracy is supposed to be. Um, on the other hand, I think diversity matters. I think we see that when we have diverse legislative bodies, um, we have better outcomes. So to Ruben's point, it's part of our job to recruit those folks to run. And if I could just add, I, I agree with my colleagues and I agree with you. The republic, the, the, the country depends on electing the best people we can find. Um, so what, where I would say that you're judging without looking is missing something is just that um, we know, for example, the first people to really take a hard look at whether women and men as a committee were better at solving a problem than just men were the people who were most interested in whether that could be profitable, the banks. And the banks have done great research on investment committees that are mixed and investment committees that are single sex. Mm -hmm. And the investment committees that are mixed gender do better. And the reason I raise this with you, and there are lots of reasons why, but women have a, have a different way of approaching the investment. Their considerations are different, and those considerations turn out to be ultimately more profitable. So the issue is, what is it that you're not seeing that is not currently at our disposal to do better? And sometimes, if you don't know what to look for, you can't see it. So we're all much better at getting the best person if we can see bigger. Pradeep, um, council member from South San Francisco, go ahead. And then Shiloh, and then Paul Kropka. And then I'll, we'll get, keep your hands there. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, this is a great uh, panel and discussion is bringing a lot of new ideas. I have one question. So I understand the uh, needs that are very, very paramount right now to make sure that the women participate in the process of our democratic decision making and where we are going. But I would assume, like everything else, that women group itself has a lot of diversity built in, in terms of their opinion, backgrounds, and their individual opinions. How do these get represented in movements like all three of you are talking about? Are those diversity of opinions among the women themselves are gearing towards the common goal or they are still not agreeing on all the principles you are espousing? Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Who, would, <laughs> who wants to start? Great. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think that we absolutely have a lot of work to do. Uh, and there, there's a term that I use very often with my uh, organization, Women Get It Done, and that, that's the term of intersectionality. And the idea of that is that we aren't just women. We also are, we have socioeconomic differences. We have, um, you know, uh, racial differences and ethnic differences. Um, and we have plenty of different isms, as you could say, right? Ableism, you name it. Um, and so, once you peel back the lens and start connecting with somebody, not just because of their gender, you see that you have more commonalities than you have differences. And that's part of what we do, is we um, peel back the lens and have those conversations. But we have a lot of work to do. Shiloh Ballard, Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. The mic is coming. You're right in the middle. <laughs> So actually, I want to piggyback on the last question and give you an opportunity to talk more about this. Um, I just spent a week in Chicago at the PolicyLink Equity Summit, and um, Linda Sarsour, who was one of the um, uh, organizers of the Women's March, was on one of the panels. And um, as we all know here, that became a hotbed of conversation around gee, the Women's March is ending up only being white women and mm -hmm. is being led by white women. And it became problematic and a place where people were having these wonderful conversations about intersectionality. Um, and, and, you know, gee, the white woman's top issues are reproductive rights and equal pay. 
but what about the black mother in New York? That's not her top issue. So I'm wondering if you can speak to mm -hmm. how you all are making sure that as you're recruiting uh, candidates, it's not ending up only, you know, the, the folks who are self-selecting in are the confident white women. And right. um, also, I'm hoping you can talk about once we recruit all these new candidates and they're getting elected, um, what we're doing to make sure they legislate well. So I'll, I'll address that, that first part, because um, we talk about it a lot within my organization. Um, and one of my closest friends is the woman who organized the San Francisco Women's March the first year and the second year. And she's a queer woman of color. And San Francisco is also incredibly progressive and, and far left. So we talk about this very often. And there's been a, a tussle in cities around the country um, between white women and women of color and different backgrounds. Um, even so far as you know, the, the Women's March logo, it was criticized because the white woman was in front when they designed it. And I think that as a young white woman, we have a huge obligation to take a step back and let women of color and who have these more so disadvantaged backgrounds have the microphone and let them lead the movement. I think that's a huge priority. Mary and Ruben? Yeah, um, I'm happy to be able to tell you that in 2016, three quarters of our recruits were women of color and for 2018, 80% uh, of them are women of color. Um, so I think that's nine of the 11 women we recruited in 12 winnable seats for progressive women. So it's not hard to do. Uh, there are great women out there. It, it does take more than a passing interest. You need to be committed to making it different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are, and so that's what you do. And if people tell you that counting doesn't matter, it most assuredly does matter to the people who are being counted. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. so uh, but it also wasn't something that we set out to do. So we were lucky in that because in California, most of the progressive districts would automatically bring you talented people of color. Mm -hmm. So it, that it was not, we're, we're not to be given that much credit for it, it but I'm pleased that it is the way that it is. Mm -hmm. um, I can say 100% of our Hispanic <laughs> candidates are Hispanic. Um, so, it, so, but it, and uh, it does take um, it does take some work to get some you know qualified people be willing to, to, to run for office. It's hard work. And during breakfast, Mary was sharing with me uh, a lot of the work that she's been doing in the Central Valley, and there's a lot of untapped talent out there. I think that what we need to do is give people the microphone, encourage them to step up, and, and we'll see who um, steps up and, to, and to runs for office. And I'm going to ask, actually, the panel to address the second part of Shiloh's question, because oh, yeah. it's very important about how do you make sure they legislate well. And well is, I mean, how do you define yeah. well? Um, I'll define it for us. Um, <laughs> no. Totally works for me. Yeah. No. Um, so you know, we uh, started out to kind of like a you know, a, a, in essence, a political hack you know exercise of getting folks elected. And uh, what we found really quickly was that when you get good people elected that don't have experience in politics or in policy necessarily, or not a depth of experience, they need some help. So we actually now have a 501c4 and a three mm. that help with training. Mm -hmm. So we help folks that are aspiring to run for election, or even those that have already won, city council members, school board members, and then we help them with training on issues that they're interested in, from you know ethics and FPPC issues that are very practical for elected officials, to issues of transportation and energy and, and healthcare and those kinds of things. At Close the Gap, we do two things. First, we do have three criteria uh, by which we um, evaluate folks that we're considering recruiting. Um, uh, you need to be uh, pro-path out of poverty. Um, and that's a tough one, and we work with people to define it for their, it, what matches their district. What can they do? Um, the, the second um, is you need to be pro-choice. Um, and the third is you need to be pro-public schools. And we, we believe that, um, I know, 
Um, <laughs> and so uh, right off the bat, people who have different views or we, we, I want to be careful here because people uh, of goodwill and great talent see these things through different lenses and, and reflecting their districts appropriately. Mm -hmm. So we're, we, are, we work with them, but we also take all of our recruits, multiple recruits in a single district, through a three-step process to say, are you personally ready to do this? And all that that means, from what Carol said earlier, are you ready to see the three worst things you've ever done on the front page of the paper? <laughs> and, and is your family ready and are you financially ready? And are you a match for your district? Do you know these people, these yeah. institutions, the cultures, the traditions? Do you understand the business people, what they need from a legislator? So we work with them to go through that. And the third is, can you be a competitive candidate? To Ruben's earlier comment. Mm -hmm. So we live with them. Now, we couldn't do this on the specials that were just in Los Angeles. We had a really mm -hmm. short l runway. But normally, we're recruiting right now for 2020. So we can spend time with people and figure it out and make, what, I guess what I would say is we let them know that this is a serious occupation for serious people because hundreds of thousands of people depend on you. And that helps people get focused. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely important to make sure that we're holding our politicians and elected officials accountable. Absolutely, without a doubt. I'm very interested in making sure that once we get women through the door, that they all know each other. And so that we're starting to build a network of them keeping each other accountable, but also supporting each other and opening doors for more women and reaching back and, and bringing up more uh, women in the next generation. Okay. Paul and then Carol has a list of people that she's <laughs> taking. He's taking names. <laughs> Carol's good at taking names. Um, <laughs> Paul Krupka, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very impressed with uh, uh, and, and appreciative and grateful of the work you're doing. I think it takes a, a tremendous amount of passion to stand up and, and organize and do this in and out. I'm also very impressed with your two wing, your two wing people. These moderators have, uh, are, have proven success in, in <laughs> carrying the load and, and listening and bringing things forward. So. Um, on the spirit, on the, on the, in, in the spirit of um, looking back, looking back, and looking at where we are now, think about. Tell me about your perspectives on collaboration in the political arena. How has it changed? Collaboration. <laughs> oh my gosh. Collaboration. What? You mean interparty? Yeah. I, I just oh, let me let me, let me cut to the about? cut to the chase. I'm I'm I abhor the term partisan. Uh -huh. I, I I'm very leery of of fights um, aisle uh, across the aisle. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm yeah. interested in my legislators stepping outside of their um, quote unquote yeah. silo. D R L whatever they are, mm -hmm. and talking to one another. Have you seen a change in the years in, in how collaboration has, how that has, it's how that has happened? I think it's tougher now, I don't know if you agree, it's just because there's more of a polarization in the American electorate. And then within each of these districts or jurisdictions, you see that as well. Um, and so what I do see is more of an expo exploitation of uh, candidates on either side of the aisle, just exploiting that more. and, and you know, and gravitating towards uh, either end of the spectrum. And then, yeah, um, and I think where you see the, the bridge building, it's usually based on legislators or office holders, uh, men or women, who are actually reaching across to try to get something done. That's what I've seen, just to kind of, so it, it speaks to who we elect uh, to these offices. In the back, Emily Beach, Councilwoman from Burlingame. Can you hear me? Are we off? Yeah, okay. you're on. Thank you. Great panel. I'm curious if you look in your crystal ball and as we achieve more gender parity in Sacramento, what can you just to dovetail a little bit on Shiloh's comment, what policy issues do you see surfacing that you think in your crystal ball women are going to push forward that we haven't really seen at the forefront? Could you get a little bit more specific about uh, specific priorities you think we'll see more uh, specific policy and legislation in the years ahead? I'd love to jump in with that and answer that question. Um, 
I, if I was looking at my crystal ball, I would think that issues pertaining to women in the workplace are going to become a high priority. Not just equal pay, but issues like affordable childcare yes. and daycare. Yes. Um, and making sure that there's a plan for women that when they have children, that they can have options to go back to work if they so choose. We've seen models in other countries of how they do it better than we do here at home. But I think that uh, making sure that women have more options and have more support will allow them to go back to the workplace. And I think it's also going to be a priority because it's, it's shown that it's better for the economy. So this is to Paul's question and to yours. The most collaborative across party lines uh, group of legislators I know are the women of the United States Senate. I was going to say the same thing. And they have come together around budget, around ag policy, and uh, when their colleagues could not through the normal uh, system of either leadership collaboration or committee collaboration, they have gone off, uh, now 23 of them, and said, we have other things to do. Let's figure this out so we can go home to our families. <laughs> and they have done it. And so I would say it's doable. And while I would never say that as a group they are better, I will say in this regard, I think they're onto something. <laughs> well, 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 well put. <laughs> Ann Schneider uh, from the Councilwoman from the city of Millbrae. I don't know if you all remember, I was a little critical last year, so I just want to say you're fabulous. And thank you, Assemblyman Mullen. Um, we have a couple of Emerge graduates here. I, I know I'm an Emerge graduate. Kirsten's over Hi. there. I don't know if I've missed some. And just to throw that out there, Emerge has their new Central Valley program. I'm sure you all yeah, know of it. But if any of you know of women who want to run in the Central Valley, it's, it's there now. They don't have to travel to San Francisco or LA. When I went through the Emerge program, I was the odd one. I'm an older white woman. And it got, gave me the chance to meet women of color of many different socioeconomic bases. And for the first time, I had a sisterhood. Yes. And for the first time, I saw things through different eyes. So that ability to get people together from different socioeconomic backgrounds is absolutely a fabulous experience. So tell me more about your salon. And I, I don't know if Catherine Colton is here. Catherine, there she is. She does this amazing program trying to get women of any party in the, in the county together. And so kudos to Catherine. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about your salon mm -hmm. and getting more of us together to talk. Now for the men, we have Emerge men. We love our Emerge men. Kevin DeLeon being a great example of that. So we don't hate men. We just <laughs> get to talk differently. <laughs> So tell us more about thank, the salon. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of Emerge. Um, so it's nice to hear that a number of you have gone through the program. I've trained, I've been one of the trainers for uh, a few years. And Mary, I wonder, have you trained them as well? I, I, but we're, yeah, definitely part of the Emerge family. Um, and it's also nice to hear there aren't a lot of multi-partisan organizations out there. Um, so it's nice to hear that um, there's another group doing the same, similar work. Um, so the model, it really is, and I'll just get specific, and I'd love to talk to you more afterwards. Um, they're usually two hours long. They take place in someone's home because it creates that environment of comfortability. Um, it's the kind of place that, the culture that we create, it's the kind of place where um, no matter what happened to you that day, you walk in, you kick off your, heel, your heels, and you grab a glass of wine or some snacks, and you know, you're starting to meet other people, and it's very casual. Um, so after, you know, mixing and mingling, I ask everybody to sit in a circle and we go around the room and introduce ourselves and we do something called a lady brag. And that was based, it's like an icebreaker, but it's also based off the fact that women don't brag enough about their accomplishments. And it also allows you to dig in deeper into someone so that you uh, are learning more about them just based off their appearance, what they're wearing, what their race is. Um, and you get to know somebody. And once you create that environment where people are comfortable and they're sharing personal things, then you can tap into this idea of intersectionality and really build these important bonds with people because you learn, uh, you learn about these shared experiences, which is very powerful in building up this sisterhood and probably similar experiences that you went through with Emerge because running for office, it's not just hard, like hard because of time. It takes a lot of emotional investment, and it's a roller coaster when you're running for office and putting your, your name out there. So having uh, 
your girl squad, right, and your mm -hmm. sisterhood behind you um, can also make, the, make a big difference in whether you win or lose a campaign. And we're not just, with Women Get It Done, it's not just for people who want to run for office. What it is, it's, it's a, a feeder for people to come meet other people, and then we uh, tell them about things like Emerge and Close the Gap and all these other um, offices. And one of, you know, one of the, the greatest um, memories I have was from a, a few years ago when I went to uh, an Emerge reception uh, for the women who were going to start uh, the class, I had two or three women, they only accept 16 or 18 people, I had two or three women come up to me independently and say, Kate, because of Women Get It Done, I heard about Emerge and I got mm -hmm. accepted to the program. And so it's, it's really powerful to have a, a community like that. Roseanne, do you have names? No, but I was going to ask Ruben to actually comment from, um, because Every time at the Progress Seminar, you're going to knock some things out of the park. You're, it, that's why feedback is so important. So, and then you're going to fail. And that's why you want to call on me. <laughs> and then we love, Ruben has been a part of San Mateo County for a very long time. And he's experienced things across the country. So I'd love to hear, Ruben, you were elected to the County Board of Supervisors back in mm -hmm. 92. Two. So tell us kind of your thoughts about women, about men, about Latinos. Love them all, love them all. <laughs> Just the whole bit. Just Good add answer. Add yeah. This is kind of your time to say what you think. Well, um, wow, I didn't even get this at home. Time to say what I think. Um, so uh, here's the thing uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, being somewhat contrarian, growing up in North Fair Oaks and East Palo Alto and, um, you know, just wanting to try to make, mix things up, move, you know, make things change. Um, and, you know, being part of this crazy party called the Republican Party that, can't, you know, is kind of lost nationally and, and in the state is just kind of dying on the vine. Um, and, and I look at, you know, how do you get kind of robust governance and, you know, competitive campaigns and all that. And, and my sense is you need, you need a strong two-party system. So that's why we're trying to build up, you know, a, a loyal opposition, if you will, uh, hopefully with good people that are California Republicans. Um, <laughs> and you know, when I look at when I look at uh, uh, kind of what's happened nationally, and someone, uh, yeah, Katie, I didn't look at the numbers, but I guess white women overall in America voted for Donald Trump. Same thing happened in, in 2012. Uh, uh, Mitt Romney won the white woman vote. Uh, but he uh, lost the, white, the, the, the women vote overall. Uh, and, uh, and he also, same thing, Mitt Romney, because those are numbers I'm familiar with, won the, the, the white millennial vote, but he lost the millennial vote overall. Why is that? Because we're more diverse. Because it, you, know, you can't just win, even Republicans can't win just on the white vote, right? So what we're doing, you know, my, my contention has been, it's not about like Hispanic, just, just electing Hispanics because Hispanics are the best elected officials and all. It's if, if you can d demonstrate a commitment to diversity and diverse leadership, I think that, that translates across all different ethnicities and sex. Uh, I think uh, what, you, know, you, you just have to demonstrate in California a commitment to diversity and that's what the Republican Party has to do. Um, and that's, you know, that's why I'm, I'm uh, uh, dying trying to do this thing, and it's a long-term effort. Um, if it's gonna work at all, it's gotta be a, just a long, long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Nori, Mark, Dana, and then I have a whole group over here. I have Donna, so uh, Nori, do you, or the mic, uh, here, the microphone's coming. So if you could, I, we know many of you, I mean, I, and I'm trying to call people out by name, but please identify yourself when you get the microphone. Mm -hmm. It really helps. Good morning. My name's Nori Java. My question is about likability. It seems that women are held to a different standard of likability in public office than men. And so I'm curious how you coach women about when they're on the campaign trail about being likable and seen as collaborative and diplomatic or being outspoken 
on their issues, because I think there's a fine balance. Mm -hmm. And then also, once they get in office, how do you coach them? You know, which one is better? So this is a, um, we have studied this issue for a long time because it is the most challenging issue. It's particularly challenging for women running for executive office. So women running for mayor, governor, president. Voters need to know that a woman is strong enough to manage a crisis, whether it's a budget crisis with the legislature or it's a wildfire that's going to cause mudslides and displace thousands of people. Quickness, decisiveness, clear thinking, all of those go into establishing that you are strong enough, clear thinking, and make decisions that's an executive quality that you must demonstrate, male or female. There is a higher bar for women on this quality. Now, women who can demonstrate that they are clear thinking, decisive, strong, are not always likable. For many voters, a woman who acts that way, right, there's something about her that we think Women think, really? And men think, I don't know about that. Yep. And the problem <laughs> is that men who are very good at this are the standard, par for the course. But it has been their province. So the brave few who venture into this, they're pioneering how to be both and we used to use the word tough, but quite honestly, it's not about tough. It's about strength. And the, and the formula that we understand is strength made up of those qualities I described and warmth. Mm -hmm. And warmth. And a couple of governors you know have done this very, very well. Jennifer Granholm is one of my favorite mm -hmm. yeah. examples, the former mm -hmm. governor of Michigan, who is just a warm and wonderful person and had to deal with the auto crisis and bailing out the auto companies and, and did a fine job with President Obama's help. So you're absolutely right that it's a challenge. We do know how to handle it. Some personalities can do it better than others. It's unfortunate, and it's just one of the many weights, which we haven't talked about, that when you say, is it even up now when men and women run against each other? It's more even, but not entirely for legislators. And we still have some challenges, as we have all witnessed mm -hmm. recently in our history, uh, with executive office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like to add to that, because we talk a lot about, when we're running women, strength and warmth. And I'm a visual person, so you can actually plot certain people's personalities on a graph. How strong are they? How warm or cold are they? Um, one example, uh, Hillary Clinton. Strong, capable, I don't think anybody would really disagree with that. But you hear time and time again, well, I don't like her. And so on the campaign trail, they tried to warm her up a little bit and run her as the grandma in some states. Um, and it was a strategy that ultimately didn't work out for a number of different reasons, right? But you can see how people knew she was strong, but they didn't like her. So they tried on the campaign trail to, to make mm -hmm. her more likable. Um, hey, Jocelyn Manolo, the mayor of Daywood City, has been waiting for about 10 minutes or so. OK, ago. sorry, Jocelyn. You're over in the, over there. So and then we'll go, so Jocelyn, Donna Coulson, Mark, and Dana. So there was a comment earlier that said, um, you know, if there's covert sexism, you know, speaking up is actually one of the ways. But I, I, for me, I think it's actually two ways. It's not necessarily just speaking up, but also for others to be mindful around, um, you know, just actions and perceptions. Um, how can the culture change in the political realm to omit this type of covert or overt sexism in, in, in the higher office? I think I've heard Mary say this before. You gotta name it to shame it, you know? And that's like really like the, the first step. Um, and I think that at least what I'm seeing firsthand, I think it's also very implicit. I, I think that, that people aren't trying to be sexist, you know? Um, I think people are generally good-hearted. 
But there are certain things about someone's look or the sound of their voice or their credentials and their accomplishments that sometimes you can have a woman who's a more qualified uh, candidate, but you see this in the press too, right? They'll blow, they'll blow up some guy and say, he's awesome, they'll put him on a pedestal, he's great, um, but this woman, she's, I don't know, whatever. Right? And we see this when we're um, hiring people, and you see it in the interview process, and you see it on the resumes, um, how there's implicit bias. Um, and so that's why a number of these large organizations have created this, um, it's called like a, 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 like a blind application process, where they stripped anything from a resume that uh, would signal whether it's a man or a woman. And so um, I think there's a, a lot of work that still needs to be done. So we, let's see, uh, Donna, so again, please identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Donna Coulson, City of Burlingame, Vice Mayor. Um, I recently learned that the governor has put forth a mandate to appoint 50% women to all the state commissions. and. I think that's a really interesting look at it because the notion was we can't always control who's elected, but we can control who's appointed. And in our city, we appoint a lot of commissions. We struggle, struggle to get women and diversity into our commissions. And I think it's a, it's a kind of a, a runway for future political engagement. So how do we do that and kind of what do you think about that in general? I think it's a good aspirational goal. I mean, um, you know, to say that we're, we're going we're to uh, affirmatively go out there and try to find qualified people, in this case, women, who can fill some of these slots. I think that's good. I think you get into a challenge if it's a, if it's a mandate. Mm -hmm. um, but if you say, hey, a city council, for example, says, let's evaluate ourselves. And let's say, you know, can we, can we get to that goal, which you, know, you would think theoretically shouldn't be that hard. And I know uh, Carol mentioned the county's already at that, uh, at that number. So, but I, I know it is hard. It's hard to get people to, to be willing and able to, to take on some of these positions. There's a group in uh, Santa Clara and San Mateo County called WIRE, and I forget what that's an acronym for, but its goal is to fill uh, com commission positions uh, and also recruit women to, uh, to run. It's nonpartisan. The women who run it are terrific. And I would encourage you to uh, Google Wire. They're doing a good job. Let me also say that there's another group in San Mateo County called Women's Community Leadership Network, WCLN, does five trainings a year for teaching people how to join, a, a, apply for a board or a commission. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah. Good. Lots of resources. So there's four more questions, uh, four more people that are asking questions. Who knows if there's multiple questions within <laughs> I, those people. I got two okay. over here. I got two over here. <laughs> and Carol has two over there. So we're going to go through these relatively quickly. We have Mark Simon. Uh-oh. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Question is for you. Um, Uh-oh. You mentioned the orange elephant in the room. And I want to ask sort of an inferential question to the other two, which is, how do you recruit Hispanics and Latinos to run for office when you've got a president who's saying some really, um, some things that you know within the community is very troubling and um, disenchanting, even um, turns people off? And on the flip side, how much of what the president's rhetoric and his activities, if you call, want to call them that, have been uh, a factor in, in the rising number of women who are running for office? Wow. Well, I know it has been a factor for women and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, millennials and others running for, for office. In terms of your first question, yeah, it's something that I really worried about in the 16th cycle and, and last year in uh, odd number of elections. Uh, we had some elections, in, mainly specials and, and other municipal elections in 17 and some gearing up. What, interesting phenomenon. I was really concerned about it, and, and it is a concern. It's, you know, it doesn't help with the Hispanic recruitment into the party when you have Donald Trump as the, the head in terms of some of the rhetoric that he's using. Um, but what I found um, as our candidates, because our candidates can be moderate, some are very conservative, some are very moderate, um, uh, 
they get attacked for being Republican. And in San Mateo County, you know, I mean, a very Democratic area, you know, put a Republican label on a candidate and that's, you know, can damage. But what I found, and I was afraid of, you know, mailers with our candidates morphing into Donald Trump and that's gonna be used. And when candidates are running in, say, cities in East, Southeast LA, they oh my gosh, that's a death knell. What I found is if you have a good candidate and that candidate is meeting the most likely voters going to their doors and doing it in a consistent way and actually running a good solid campaign, that stuff just goes over the top because the voters, if they're actually connecting and they're right on the issues and they're doing a solid job of connecting with the most likely voters, that, that it doesn't stick. Those attacks don't mm -hmm. stick because they're not personal. They're kind of overreaching and as a matter of fact, they're kind of counterproductive because uh, voters generally speaking will say, well, hey, I, I met I met Bernadette, and she's, you know, she's great. She's not a crazy, a crazy you know, Republican. So it reminds me of a story some of you have heard when I was running. Um, you'll remember I, uh, I won the, my first race for Board of Supervisors by 50.1% of the vote. And that's when we were running um, countywide. That basically was one vote per precinct in say, all of San Mateo County. And when I was going door to door, um, uh, um, asking for votes in North Fair Oaks, and, uh, and I was talking to this uh, you know, Mexican-American woman. I said, I'm running for county supervisor. And she says, oh, no sé si puedo votar para ti. Eres republicano. Uh, she says, I don't know if I can vote for you. You're a Republican. And you know when you're going door to door, you got to keep moving. So I eventually had to say, look, mom, I really need your vote. Uh, and, and we got you know, 50 points. I think she voted for me, because I think I was the one vote in my, in my precinct. Um, but uh, I forget what your question was, Mark, but the last thing is for our candidates, you know, you think, you know, Hispanic Republicans and some folks that aren't involved politically think, oh, great, Hispanic Republican, you get all the Republicans and you get all the Hispanics, you know, in your coalition. You're a Hispanic Republican, you don't get any Hispanics and you don't get any Republicans on the natural. You actually have to work yeah. really hard to assure both, if you will, that you're, you know, you're legitimate and you care about their issues. Sorry. <laughs> Um, let's go to Danny Gasparini, Redwood City entrepreneur. <laughs> I don't think I need a. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was elected in 1992, the year of the woman. Had no idea that I was um, caught up in that wave. And then I said, yeah, I'm a woman, so I guess this will. Um, this will do. Um, I remember the night Jackie and I and, and Anna, um, we ended up at some hall, I think, and someone had asked the question, why weren't women um, in this magnitude elected in other, any other elections? And Anna had said, um, because this is the first time there were unopposed seats available. And I thought that was a real telling argument that mm -hmm. as women, our gender tends not to want conflict. So if there's a seat that isn't open, we tend not to want to challenge it. At least this was back in the 90s. I think it's women have come into their own and it's very different um, today, but back then. But there were a lot of open seats that either, the, either there were, um, um, retiring out or they had met there. So one, I thought that was a, a, a great statement to hear that, um, but we should get out and challenge that. But um, as a Italian female Republican, where do I belong? <laughs> um, I believe in a strong economic, um, economic development, strong economy, and that's, that's my Republicanism. But I sort of feel like I, I might not get support in any of your camps. <laughs> That's a great question. It, again, it goes back to the identity politics. And um, it, it, it's, um, so as a candidate, I think you get some support over here, although, well, I guess you have to be a progressive <laughs> candidate to get. Yeah, that's a great question. That's, um, it, it's a challenge. Um, all I know is I, I've got limited time, of mon time and money. And so, you know, if I'm gonna change any part of the world, I, I know the Latino world, I know, if you will, I know the kind of Republican world. And so that's where I feel I can apply that time and money and make some difference and get some good, good folks elected. Um, but, uh, but you do get, you know, into the issue uh, of identity politics, which if you play it out, you know, all the way through, then um, you do kind of get into a kind of a tribalism, right? And say, okay, yeah. just women will vote just for women and men mm -hmm. just for men or, or Republicans just for, all of which is not, not correct, true. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> women it don't vote for women. It, it just isn't. I would say right now, Danny, if you have to come on one side of the line, we have more women who are pro-business than they have uh, 
Say me or something. Yes, then I, I think right now it's, it is easier for you to be a pro business woman uh, with us than to just Democrats. be a woman in the Republican Party. And it's, re uh, it's, it's a really hard thing. So if you stay, change it. And, th and that's, I mean, to me, that's Ruben's calling card. I mean, he has stuck it out <laughs> in thick and thin mm -hmm. to say we can do better. Mm -hmm. And that is enormously honorable and mm -hmm. laudable, and he's right about mm -hmm. two parties. But you can't stay and not speak up. You've got to speak up. Because what's happening isn't right for the country, let alone leave the parties aside. It's bad for the country, and we all need to be patriots. So, <laughs> <laughs> trying to recruit you. Uh, Kate just said something. I, I heard you under your breath. <laughs> women don't vote for women. They don't. Uh, we vote for qualifications based on issues, but women don't vote for women as a, a block. Right. You know. That's right. So, uh, Dana, you've been waiting a long time. Hi, I had a question for Mary. You said you were looking for candidates that were pro-public schools, and I wanted to know, does that inclusive of charter school systems, which are often serving better than public schools, particularly in underserved populations throughout the Bay Area? If they're public charters. We don't, we, we don't, our, our view is that the public schools are one of the few remaining institutions that gives us an opportunity to have, a, a, and gives people opportunity generally. The, the compact that we have is that there are certain ways in which we all start together, and we can move forward together. And the public schools are a basic element of that belief, mm -hmm. and anything that weakens them ultimately is not good for the country. So, you know, we may be, we may be feminists, we may be feminists, but we too are patriots. So that's a very important thing for us. And I just want to warn you all about something that is really weakening the ability of good people to go to the legislature. Right now, independent expenditures are spending more money determining the outcome of legislative races than the candidate campaigns. It's true. And this is true, it's been true for a long time. When I was first coming up in politics, the trial lawyers and the doctors were always going at it. But, but it wasn't at the mm -hmm. scale that the charter school movement and the teachers are today. So there are progressive women that we support through Close the Gap, have supported, who are in the legislature today, who received tons of charter school money, and the money went against their opponents, not because they're in agreement, but because their opponent was endorsed by CTA, the California Teachers Association. This was confusing to everyone. Now, this happens in other races. We have a recruit up, uh, up uh, in, from Winters, a wonderful assemblywoman named Cecilia Aguiar Curry, mm -hmm. and she was the recipient of all kinds of, of independent expenditures. And she was the first time, I mean, she'd been the mayor of Winters, but not involved in the, the politics as you all know it. And so to have the agriculture industry and the oil industry in her race for and against, and she's I don't know them. W what do I do? And this is, you know, this is distorting our system. And this is one mm -hmm. of the errors mm -hmm. that flows from uh, money equals speech. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, you've got a lot of assignments, and I don't want to overcomplicate it, but <laughs> we need to think very carefully about who is for who and why. It's not just party. It's not just who the candidate is. Where is this information coming from? So for us, we are very clear about this, but our candidates have received all different kinds of support and money, and it hasn't been logical or necessarily reflective of what they believe. So you have to be watchful. And that question came from Dana Storr, who is uh, the CEO of the San Mateo County Event Center. Dana, I just wanted to, because you're a big supporter of all of this. Okay, Georgia Antonopoulos. 
with Thrive, which is the association of nonprofits. Alan Sarver has been waiting. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the incredible work you are doing. It sounds uh, challenging, so we really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> my question and comment is in response to the earlier comment about coaching women and the coachability of women around likability. And I think it's really sort of uh, important um, how we talk about this, and it's dangerous, I think, to put the onus on women to change themselves, and I think, rather than talking about authenticity. And I think we really need to push back on that narrative. Uh, it, it was sort of problematic, I think, in the prior election. It's a failure of culture, it's not a failure of women. And, and that's something that I think we start, need to kind of get rising to the top. So. We don't need to necessarily change ourselves, make ourselves more this or that and the other thing. I think culture, for whatever reason, isn't ready for a women, woman leader. What can we do to change culture, to change, change men, boys, um, yeah. around, around being ready for a female leader? We don't need to be more likable. We just need culture to be ready for us. So that's my question. If, yeah, thank you for that. If you have the answer of how we can change culture almost overnight, or at least between now and November, nope. I, that's a million dollar idea. You know? I don't think it's, it's not overnight, but I think it's a you know, like this year, yeah, I mean, I think you've seen some movement this year, and mm -hmm. it's kind of maintaining that momentum, I would think. Yeah, I, I want to just uh, respectfully disagree with you. Everybody has external challenges and internal challenges, regardless of your gender. For women, some of those internal challenges are socialized. And no one will change them except us. So when you talk about confidence, what, what's required to change the culture is to speak up, to go march, to be challenging, to say that's not right. We need to do it differently. We, as a gender, have not traditionally done that. One of the things that we can do to change the culture, which will allow us to be more totally authentic, is to speak up. OK, so I have, and if I could find my list, I have three more names, and then I'm, uh, we're going to wrap it up. So I, where did I put them? I have, I have a piece of paper here. I think, there was. I, th I think we should go to Alan Sarver. Oh yeah, Sophia Alan Sequoia Sarver, District. Ah. then Sharice, then Gary Waddell, and then Dave Baruto, and then, oh and these have to be quick. No yeah. speeches. <laughs> quick <laughs> questions. I appreciate that personally. Speak up. The answers can be. Hi, <laughs> I'm Alan Sarver from the Sequoia Union High School District, uh, where we have uh, several very successful charters in operation as part of our public school system. Uh, and in the uh, as uh, talking about schools, this weekend marks only two months since the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas shootings. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how the world has changed in only two months. I wanted to talk about the very rapid response and politiz politicization that has happened, led by the students from that school, and a lot of their effectivity in the, in the political realm came uh, through the agency of the Women's March and the March for Our Lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask you about such a rapid uh, effectiveness of political awareness and action, how much you think about the staying power of the youth that have become engaged so suddenly, and how that youthful engagement really affects the world of women in politics and what we've been talking about. <laughs> I, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge um, the Women's March and in the new marches and the movements that we're seeing, a lot of the, the a number of leaders from January of 2017 are mentoring these young people. They've flown to Chicago, they've flown to Florida to show them how it's done. And I think we should acknowledge like how, how awesome and amazing that is. And so I think that, you know, what I said earlier is that I see this generation coming up and they are now empowered by social media more than ever and we have democratized the media, right? And anybody with something to say can now say it and um, 
One also thing I want to mention about we see these young people coming up who are in high school and they're on CNN and they're leading these movements and we have to uh, applaud the public schools they went to because almost every single one of them had been taking debate classes since elementary school. So I think that the tools that they had been given, plus social media, plus what's happening um, right now with gun violence in our country, has all compounded into this next generation um, really leading this movement. So we'll go to Dave Baruto in the back, then Sharice McHugh and Gary Waddell. And Gary, you're the last question. So make sure it's make it a good, good one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, absolutely, no, absolutely no speeches. Um, I wanted to build on something that Supervisor uh, Barala said. I want to talk about the orange elephant. And luckily, I'm not wearing orange today. Um, how is the tangerine pachyderm affecting your respective programs? I'm sorry, I, I'm, Dave, I can't, can't really hear the, the audio is not good. No. Is it just me? He, no. I can't hear. Dave, can you come up a little bit? Because it's it's. It, How I is Donald Trump's it. presence affecting your respective programs? Oh yeah, it makes it harder in California. I mean, when uh, when you've got a head of a party who is so unpopular in any area, which is most areas of California, um, it makes it really hard to um, to have people who are candidate potential candidates who are willing to run. With, you know, and be registered as Republican, so that's hard. Although we get some folks that are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, in the work that we do, which is mainly local, um, the, the issues of national politics um, don't necessarily become top issues. The top issues happen to be safety, education, uh, transportation, these kinds of very, very local issues mm -hmm. that make a difference. So if our candidates are focused and in tune with the voters on those issues, I feel like the, the overall mega issue of national politics and the presidency kind of um, uh, fade away and aren't that important in those elections. Sharice? Um, I am wearing orange, both of you. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not the elephant in the room. Uh, Sharice McHugh, Half and Bay Coastside Chamber. So, um, 22 years ago when I started in the chamber business, I would be asked a question that being the people pleaser that I am, I would politely answer, but then turn around and go, really? If I was a man, I never would have been asked that question. And it happens all the time. And part of me wants to say, at some point, we've got to say, if we're gonna change the culture and whatnot, Georgia, is that that question isn't acceptable and start pointing out that that question is acceptable. Same for Republicans. I think there are questions that are asked to Republicans that you wouldn't ask a Democrat and, and most likely Hispanic women as well. When do we draw the line and what do you advise your candidates on how to handle those kind of questions? Well, like I mentioned, um, I'm running Eleni Kunalakis's campaign. It's a statewide race. She's been to 58 counties, and California is incredibly diverse, um, from the coast to the rural counties. And I'm fortunate enough to have my own, I'm gonna say, girl squad of other female campaign managers um, from around the state who are about my age, who are also running uh, women for office. And every once in a while, we'll jump on the phone and check in with each other, and we'll share the questions that we heard on the road, okay? Mm -hmm. Things That's like, cool. is that really her first name? Why doesn't she cut her hair? And of course, the classic one, who's home watching the kids? <laughs> right? And so I don't have an answer for you, but I do think that one thing that Mary said is that we have to put it on ourselves, you know, to advise our, our friends and neighbors to stop asking those questions because they're irrelevant. But I think when you're a candidate running for office, you have to be gracious in the moment and answer them. I would just but, say to to um, over the years, what I've learned about this, just interpersonally when someone asks a question, you know, most of the time people aren't intentionally being demeaning or mm -hmm. diminishing. Mm -hmm. they, uh, that's not their intent, but they are a creature of culture or their experience. And so I find a lot of times if you just say, you know, I saw a picture the other day. I was saying, it was saying to Joe, it was a picture of a, another White House picture of oh, all yeah, older yeah, yeah. white men. And so, you know, I just said, you know, where's Don Draper? 
You just, you want to say, this, it, it, there's not, you're not in this century. Get with it. You know, don't, don't you really want to be a modern person? And so I find that it's not, it just, it, it, having it be about you and them isn't usually useful. Most people don't hear that because they become so defensive. But if you say, ay, 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 and start with humor, you get a lot further. And they'll think you're a great gal, and they won't ask you that question again. <laughs> That's a good point. Gary? And if any of the, if Mary or Kate would like to circle back, because I think when Dave Baruto, who is the chief of staff of Supervisor Pine, asked the question about the current administration, he, he wasn't just looking at oh. our only Republican on the panel. <laughs> he was looking for more. Am I the only Republican? Do you want us to respond after this question? In the room? Sure. Thank you. I'm Gary Waddell. Uh, thank you for this. So yesterday we were talking about the importance of short-term action, but also taking the long view. As someone that has a, a view that we need to be doing more civics education as a general in our schools, have you seen powerful ways to engage girls in, in envisioning themselves as leaders and boys as envisioning girls as leaders as well so that we can change the equation in the future? Yes, I see a, a lot of it. One of um, some of your congresswomen, Anna Eshu, has made a practice these last couple of years because she also is a huge advocate for civics in the, the schools to go to the schools herself and teach that class at the fourth, usually third, fourth, fifth, right in there, um, and to, to hold a class and say, um, this is what I do for a living, you could do this too. And I think for most of that kind of learning, the best is a show and tell. Uh, and so the more show and tell from women elected officials you can get, the better. So circling back, if there were anything any else, any, any other comments on uh, what it's what it's Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and, and answer your question. Um, after the election, November of 2016, uh, I know a number of people, uh, particularly women, who couldn't get themselves off their floor for the first three or four months. Hundreds, probably thousands of, of women that I know. Um, but once they reemerged into the world, uh, they were asking, how can I help, what can I do? And with our organization, Women Get It Done, it's full of, it's full of thousands of women who get things done. So they were coming to us saying, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? It was almost like a fire hose and sharing with them the different opportunities that they could get involved in one way or another. So what we saw is now we're seeing this incredible wave of awakened political activism that I'm hopeful is going to carry through in the 2018 election. So we're going to take back the House um, and we're going to get more women elected. Um. So um, I'm on the Public Policy Institute of California Board of Directors, and we do these surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, the re latest survey has women in California are nine percentage points more likely to vote for, ge for a generic Democrat for Congress uh, than they were four years ago in the last midterm elections. So there are definite consequences that are, that are happening as a result of um, you know, the 2016 election and all that. By the way, while I'm talking about PPIC, we are doing an event in Sacramento on May 14th, celebrating the 100th year anniversary of women elected to the California legislature uh, in Sacramento. If any of you are in Sacramento, uh, please be my guest. You know, I was going to say to Kate, um, Red, we're not always the most politically active county, but when we did our women's rally, we were going to be excited if three or 400 people came, yeah. and there were 4,000. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So it's been incredible, the numbers. So let's do one final no, quick no comment, good, piece of advice, thought-provoking exercise for the audience from each of the panelists. <laughs> what do you want to leave this group with today? We've had, I want to, Carol and I want to thank everyone. This has been an incredibly robust discussion. Pearls of wisdom. I know. <laughs> um, if you look up, out, out over the last hundred years of our history, once a generation 
women have an opportunity to leapfrog into a bigger set of numbers, a, a new phase. This happened in 92, but it also happened in the 70s. It happened in 1943 to 45, women going into the workforce. 25 years before that, we got the right to vote. So this is a moment. We have to make the most of it. You cannot stop. The reason we have these dips and mountains is because there are these emotional motivations that push the envelope and we make progress and then we fall back to incremental movement, sometimes way back as we did the last 10 years. We cannot stop. Whatever you think you have to do this year, do more, because it will make a difference in who leads us. Mm -hmm. And in, in addition to that, you know, there's going to be a number of different ways this year to get involved locally um, and, and on statewide campaigns. And I think it's important to get off the sidelines and, and get involved. And I think mo more importantly, if you have daughters or granddaughters, bring them to these events. Let them see what political activism is really like. Um, and I think, um, to answer one person's question earlier, um, we, can't, we can't be what we can't see. And so really mentoring the next generation to get involved and to build relationships in their community is very important. So I would say, uh, si se puede. Um, you know, the, the um, Latinos, did you feel the earthquake? About three years, well now two and a half years ago, the earthquake in California where Latinos became the single largest ethnic group in the state of California. Um, and so you talk about representation, and I think about Latinas. So, you know, if we're talking about women, uh, think about Latinas and creating role models for those uh, Latinas in San Mateo County that they can see themselves yeah. in, in office in the future. And that just take, it takes hard work and helping them aspire to Persistence. To do that. There you go. Mm -hmm. I want to thank my wingman. Thank you, Paul, for that terminology. <laughs> Carol Groom. <laughs> Carol Groom is a mentor, a friend. It's wonderful to do things like this together. I want to bring up our assembly member to close the progress seminar. <laughs> He's ready. He's ready. Thank you all. One more round of applause for the best panel we've had in a very long time. And thank you all. Standing up from one more. Thank you all very much for your attendance. We will see you on April 5th and 6th of 2019 for the next Progress Seminar. Be safe getting home. Thank you all very much. Look early, look off. Hey, Kevin. Thank you so much, Carol. For more info on the 2018 Progress Seminar or to see the footage from past Progress Seminars, go to pentv.tv slash progress seminar.